Hello, welcome everybody to uh, my day at the University of Lincoln, which is where I get to uh, come and talk to a, a bunch of different classes, as geographers, as ecologists, as bioveterinary students, as media students, and later on I'm doing a, what they call a great lives lecture, which always sounds like a bit of a frighteningly uh, scary, big, pompous title, A Great Life, but uh, hopefully there'll be some... Uh, little bit of enlightenment about my, some of my thoughts about journalism, the environment, um, where I think uh, we're getting it wrong in that space and where I think we're, we're getting it right. But the point of view of this is that it's a, uh, a live YouTube uh, interaction really. I've had some questions uh, prepared already and some can come in from you watching out there at the moment. So uh, this is my uh, chance to talk to folks who uh, can't, get to, uh, can't get to the Great Lives Lecture also with a particular focus on schools, primary and secondary, and also if you've got anything you want to ask me at all, just steam in, whether it's something about the radio work that I do on Costing the Earth, the Environment Programme, or on Country File, uh, the uh, BBC uh, Rural Affairs Programme on a Sunday, or Panorama, or anything to do with uh, that field, or just the subject areas that I work in, rural affairs, environment, energy, Brexit, you know, feel free to uh, steam in. If I don't know the answer, I'll either ignore the question totally <laughs> or I'll tell you that I don't know. Uh, but uh, that's great. So we've got some questions here already. Um, I've got some uh, paper that's, that's come through. Um, someone's asked, uh, as the investigations producer on uh, lead on Country File, you cover a huge variety of features and breaking news stories. Uh, what's been uh, the favourite story I've covered to date? It's, it's difficult to do uh, favourites, uh, but are there are a couple that really spring to mind, quite different ones. Um, as, you, as the uh, question has suggested, I do the slightly more journalistic uh, elements of the uh, programme, so where there's a, maybe a, a few tough questions to be asked or whether things aren't really going according to, uh, to plan in matters in rural Britain. So I'm just going to uh, mention a, a couple there that were really, really interesting. There was one where we did um, a film about how mountain hares, which are those beautiful white hares that you get in Scotland, um, are being culled legally. So they're being shot legally on some estates. And what made it very powerful was we had really good access. So we were up in one of these Scottish mountains. It was snowy. It was winter. And the people who were doing this shooting actually let us on to see what they were doing and why they were doing it. It was very striking because the environment was extraordinary. These animals are beautiful. And then you see them being killed. And you think, why is this happening? Their argument was that the way they... Uh, manage these hills for other shooting interests meant there was it was a good environment for hares so they were creating a lot of hares there's a bang in the background there it's uh, relevant to the shooting story um, <laughs> and they were, they were creating an environment for hares which was good for hares but that also meant there were too many so they said that whilst yes they were killing a lot of hares they were also providing an environment that allowed hares to live and thrive so an interesting uh, dilemma there so that was one that I, I, I really enjoyed. Um, another one that I, I think has been particularly interesting of late is doing stuff about um, different types of farming, particularly the, uh, say, if you get chicken farming, intensive farming. I went in a farm on uh, last week, three or four days ago, when I went into a room and there were 45,000 chickens in that same room as me. It was a room about the size of a football pitch, but it was extraordinary to get to. So those are the kind of stories that I like, really, things that allow me to get in to interesting places and talk to fascinating people. That is what I really, really like. So let's move on, see if there are some other questions on here. I'm not sure if there are any coming up on here. I'll see them if they do. But, um, let's have a look. Let's move on to the radio side now. Um, there's one thing, uh, Costing the Earth. Costing the Earth is the um, environment... Uh, documentary on Radio 4 that uh, I present most of them. Uh, Costing the Earth is the UK's only series dedicated covering environmental issues. Do you think there should be more TV and radio programmes focused on the topic? Well, the answer to that to all you BBC commissioners listening is yes, we need a prime time environment series on the BBC, preferably presented by me of course. Uh, but uh, it, joking aside, 
I, I think the environment has always been seen to be a slightly difficult sell on uh, mainstream media because they fear, people fear that it'll make the audience feel a bit guilty and a bit powerless and a bit sad about the way that the world is. And so they don't tend to commission those programmes. They don't tend to get them made. Now that has changed a bit in the last year or so, particularly after the success of the Blue Planet series, uh, David Attenborough's you know, much admired um, programme on the, the plight of our oceans. I say David Attenborough, I should of course credit the massive production team that there is uh, behind it who do an incredible job, not just the camera men and women but the producers and everyone to bring those stories to you. But because that had such a focus at the end at least on plastic pollution and because that got real traction in the wider, wider uh, public, people were really fired up by that. There is now a belief that maybe we can do more environment stories on uh, the mainstream media and television and make them, um, make them accessible, make them popular. And so my view on this is that it is possible to do these things and make them empowering, give people ideas about what they can do, what the solutions are to these environmental problems, rather than just kind of rail and depress people about the way you know, in, in some ways things are going wrong. And it's worth mentioning that I think starting, I shouldn't really be plugging other channels, but I'm going to here, I think starting about now, or certainly very soon, is a really high-end Netflix series, which is looking at the, uh, the, the sort of environment of the whole world, including the impact of our food production system on it. That is starting about now. I'm told it's going to be very good. I think they have uh, engaged a Mr. D. Attenborough, Sir D. Attenborough, to actually narrate it as well. So uh, there'll be a familiar voice on there. Okay, what else have we got here? Oh, yeah, this is a good one, because uh, I think a, a number of the audience are, are in, the, in schools. Um, there have been marches against climate change recently, but are you aware of schemes that primarily school children get a, can get a, involved in to support these efforts? Um, well, yes, the, the most uh, uh, newsworthy thing of late has been this, this boycott, uh, I think it's been a sort of Friday boycott of schools to protest against the direction of travel on climate change and to draw attention to climate change. This is something that grew out of, uh, um, I think it's a, a young uh, schoolgirl in Sweden who started this campaign, and it's now spread across the world. Now, some people are a little bit cynical about it, saying, well, do these kids really care or do they just want a day off school? And uh, maybe you guys can answer that yourselves. Uh, but it has drawn a lot of attention to this area recently. And also there have been some protests, uh, these climate resistance uh, marches, which have been uh, obviously not just for young people, but for people of all ages to show how much they really, really care about these things. And there is a feeling that uh, younger people, younger voters, care about the environment in a way perhaps that wasn't the case 10 years ago, and that the politicians are really beginning to listen. And uh, certainly, um, aside from the last few months when everything's just been Brexit-focused within politics, I think there is a feeling that the politicians are beginning to respond to, uh, to what's happening here um, and that uh, they are beginning to put envir push environment up the agenda. And I think anything that uh, people can do within the law to encourage that would be a very, very good thing. So I think uh, more forms of... Uh, uh, peaceful protest and also I'd say more forms of just putting pressure on your MP and your people to actually vote for these things, to actually care about these things because I think a combination of, of government regulation and, uh, and technology is what really helps us when it comes to climate change. Excuse me, I'm just having a little press on my screen here just to see if I'm, I'm missing anything but I don't think I am I'm sure my well, I have, do have one or two colleagues behind the screen here that can tell me if things go if things are going wrong or I should be doing anything else okay here's a good straight question what can we use as an alternative to plastic well in a number of areas you can use a number of different things so quite clearly you can replace plastic milk bottles with 
flask milk bottles, you can replace plastic bags with cotton bags or paper bags. And you can re you know, replace plastic furniture uh, with wooden furniture. But it's not necessarily the case that those replacements are better environmentally than the plastic itself. Uh, we, I did a, a program about this, a radio program, about three or four months ago, looking at some of the campaigns to go plastic free and arguing on really investigating whether it was environmentally a good idea. So if you take glass, for example, a glass bottle takes much more energy to make than a plastic bottle. It's much heavier to transport than a plastic bottle. And if you're going to reuse it, you have to wash it. Now, all those things, particularly the first two, are very heavy energy users. And so that has implications in terms of climate change. So, yes, you can use a glass bottle. Is it a good idea? I think that's debatable. Certainly because, actually, when it comes to plastic bottles, particularly milk bottles, they are very efficiently recycled, largely. Not everywhere, and clearly not everywhere around the world, but it's a, it's a product that's quite well recycled. And you get a similar kind of story with, with plastic versus cotton bags. The, the, I've forgotten the exact number of how many times you have to reuse your cotton bag before it becomes more environmentally friendly than a plastic bag properly disposed of, but it's in the hundreds. So if you're just using a cotton bag once or twice uh, and then it sits at the back of the cupboard, then really you weren't doing anything for the environment when you got that cotton bag in the first place. And I think the other thing I'd say with some of this plastic-free stuff is it's, it's just a little bit absurd. It's not going to happen. Why have we got plastic? It's because it's a fantastically useful material. Much of this iPad that I'm presenting this on is made of plastic because it, it, it's malleable, it can be formed into so many different uh, things. You know, if you look at the, the infrastructure around you in your home, in this room that I'm in, the keyboards, the chairs, the elements of the carpet, um, the light fittings, so many things are made out of plastic. And I think the idea that we're going to go back and not make them out of plastic is a little bit fanciful. So the real question with plastic is can, how can we assure that it's disposed of correctly? And correctly could mean two things. It could be directly reused, so you actually use that same plastic thing for another use. You can recycle it by turning it into something else. Or you can make it truly biodegradable. And by truly, I mean not just breaking into lots of little bits that turn it into microplastics and then you know, flow out to the sea and cause all the menace that we've seen, but actually biodegrades into something environmentally benign. Um, if you can do those things, I think that is the real question with plastics rather than replacing it. There is, a, there is a, perhaps a different thing over single-use plastics. You know, do we need those? And I think some of those, we don't need them in all environments. But the truth is we are kind of addicted to convenience and plastic really is the, the wrapping of convenience. I'll stop for a little uh, sip of coffee here with its plastic lid. I should have, bought a, uh, should have bought my own mug in for this, but I was caught out. You'll be able to judge me harshly on YouTube for that. Right, what else do we have on here? Uh, just a related one here while we're on plastics. I mean, um, apparently the BBC reported yesterday the whale was washed up in the Philippines that had 40 kilograms of plastic in its stomach. 40 kilograms, that's, that's a lot of plastic. That's, a, that's a, a roughly half my weight. Uh, what steps can we take at home at school to stop plastics getting into our oceans and harming our sea life? I'm going to answer that one very simply. Don't throw it away in the environment. Put it in the bin and make sure it gets properly disposed of. And also, Cam, the one thing that is worth thinking about, also put pressure on the government to make sure that stuff that is uh, does enter the waste stream doesn't end up being flown out to the Philippines or for us to say shipped out to the Philippines. We should be dealing with our own waste here. That's important and that is a political question. Uh, let's have a look. 
Yeah, there's a question here. Do you think we should think more sustainably when it comes to our diet and food choices? This is a, a really hot topic uh, within a lot of the areas I, I work in um, because there's a lot of concern about the impact our dietary choices are having on the world. And that might be because we choose something exotic that's flown in from the other side of the world or it might be that particularly the uh, eating of certain types of meat is considered to have a big impact in, ter in terms of climate change. And I think there is a, a lot of uh, emphasis on this at the moment. I think it's broadly true that it's a good idea both in terms of your own health and in terms of the planet's health to probably move to eating a little less meat. That's partly because uh, cows and sheep in particular emit a lot of methane themselves. Now methane is a gas which is a, a powerful uh, climate change causing global warming gas. And when particularly cows and sheep eat and digest, a lot of methane comes out, mainly from their mouths actually, mainly in, mainly in burps, a little bit from the other end as well. And that is a, a powerful uh, climate change causing gas. Now they are working on techniques to address this. There are people working on the uh, breeding cows to emit less methane, also giving them dietary supplements to talk about a seaweed that might uh, encourage them to emit less methane. But for the moment there's little doubt that they are a, a contributor to climate change. And um, uh, there's a, a feeling that maybe we should you know, be trying harder to reduce, when it comes to cows and sheep, the uh, the, the emissions and our, perhaps our, our appetite to them. Reduced to zero? I'm not convinced by that. I, a, I don't think it'll happen. And B, in other respects, um, cattle and sheep are, are good for our environment. They tend to graze in places uh, where other farming isn't, isn't possible. And although they can be overgrazed, they are part of the, the, the landscape and the uh, farming economy that we love in this country. So I'm not advocating complete abandonment. I think maybe better quality and less often would be a good mantra when it comes to meat. So I think that's one thing I'd recommend. And the other thing when it comes to, uh, uh, to, to vegetables is, yeah, if you can eat a bit more seasonally and if you can um, try and, you know, uh, err towards, or I should say, be slightly biased in favour of, uh, of eating uh, British produce, I think that would be quite a good thing. It helps the farmers. The food miles tend to be lower and you know, if it's come from locally, it might be fresher and better for you as well. So I think that's quite a good guiding principle. Okie dokie. Let's see where else we're going. Okay. <laughs> Here's a big one. Uh, what effect is climate change having in the UK today? And what effect could it have in the future? Well, this is always a really difficult one. There is no doubt that uh, climate change is changing our weather. But it's very difficult to attribute any individual weather event and say that is a result of climate change. For instance, we had a really warm February, and, I mean, really uncommonly warm. I mean, you'll all have felt it and seen it. It was extraordinary, certainly f filming... Um, stuff outside. I, I felt like you know I was still got my big coat on. I should have it felt like I should have been in shorts and a t-shirt. It was quite extraordinary in February. Uh, but you have to remember that uh, about a year ago we had the beast from the east, and it was that you know it was absolutely freezing. It was uncommonly cold. But the trends are definitely uh, for warmer, wetter winters and warmer, drier summers in the UK. We've seen that, and f uh, farmers and ecologists and everyone have seen that in their fields, seen it from their scientific analysis. It is definitely happening. Now, having said that, we in the UK are slightly protected from the immediately worst effects of climate change by being in the Atlantic, or on the edge of the Atlantic, but basically in the Atlantic. And that tends to protect us for a currently and for, for, for the next few decades against the worst excesses of, of climate change. The places where they've seen very, very steep rises in temperature 
uh, particularly the poles. So down in the South Pole, there's a, there's a big uh, peninsula that comes off the Antarctic, called the Antarctic Peninsula, and they've seen uh, temperature, average temperature changes there. I think it's approaching two degrees, which may not sound like a lot, but that really is an average. That is an awful lot. And the other place we've seen huge changes is in the, the Arctic, where the sea ice, the summer extent of sea ice, so the sea ice there expands and contracts all the time. It grows in the winter and then shrinks in the summer. That um, shrunken state, that shrunken summer state, has pretty much got consistently smaller year on year. Not quite, it's not a quite straight downward line, but it really is on a negative slope. And that is where we're seeing the biggest effects. And that matters not just in the Arctic, but it also changes the whole way our weather result, our, our weather is um, uh, driven because the, uh, the difference in temperature between the Arctic and the uh, climate uh, and the um, tropics is what drives a lot of our weather in this country, drives these winds in. So if that's going to change, that's going to have a big impact on our weather. In the future, what will it do to our weather? Well, you know, in the future, as in you know, 30, 50 years plus, that is really down to us. If we can limit global temperature rise to 1.5 degrees, which is what uh, everyone's aiming for in the scientific and political community, I say everyone, not quite everyone in the political community, most of all the President of the United States doesn't seem to care about that. However, uh, aside from him and, and, and a few others, the, the consensus is that we should try and keep below 1.5 degrees. If we do, we might not see huge changes. If we don't, then all bets are off. You know, we could see uh, the south of England becoming something equivalent to a desert, but uh, I don't think I'll be here to see that. <laughs> I've, got a, I've got a question there which isn't really relevant to me, so I think I'll ignore that. Someone wants to know if there's an architecture course available at the University of Lincoln. <laughs> Apparently there is. I'm getting a thumbs up from uh, someone behind the camera. So uh, not strictly relevant to me, but look at that. I can, uh, I can answer strange questions anyway. Um, Okay, hang on. What do I think the biggest changes are that f the food and farming industries currently face? And are you excited about some of the technology emerging to tackle these challenges? Um, quite, uh, I think the, the biggest uh, challenge for the food and, food and farming industry at the moment um, is that thing you hear about every day on the news is Brexit. And there is no doubt that um, the European Union uh, is particularly involved in the way we uh, grow our food, the way we farm, the way farming subsidised, the way environment regulations are put in place, the way food is, is regulated and packaged. And um, those things are, uh, are going to change when we leave the European Union. But I'm, gonna, I'm not going to park that one a bit. I think the, uh, one of the other uh, big changes is what's happening in technology and uh, robotics um, because there's a real challenge to some areas of farming uh, about the access to labour not having enough um, workers to do the work and robotics could have a real change there and there's another area where robotics are of great interest and this is uh, in, in large, uh, large fields of crops in arable farming that increasingly instead of using chemicals to get rid of weeds or get rid of pests you'll be able to use robots so wheeled obviously robots that will be able to go across the field and by using the same technology as can identify different faces they can identify the shape and pattern of different weeds so they can say that's a weed and zap it either chemically or, or physically or, or actually pull it out and that that will enable farmers to move away from so much use of chemicals, which is a contro controversial area anyway. Um, and uh, that could be a big, big change. It's a long way off, but some of the uh, universities are working on it. Here in Lincoln, there's a, a big robotics department, and they're very keen on uh, uh, getting, uh, getting that uh, off the ground. And in the other areas, I say, um, in, in, in horticulture, the picking and processing of of fresh fruit uh, is, is something where robots are, could come in. A few years ago I did a film where we were actually looking at a robotic hand 
that could pick a strawberry and also feel if it was ripe. It had enough sensitivity in its hand to feel if it was ripe. Now, I think there's quite a while before those are going to come in, um, but uh, it will be interesting. Okay, I've got a question on... <laughs> Here's one that I have to tread carefully on. What is your opinion on fox hunting? Um, so fox hunting or the hunting of, uh, hunting with hounds uh, of foxes was banned uh, over 10 years ago now. And since then, my feeling is that most hunts are probably obeying the new law and they can still go out with uh, horses and dogs, but instead of hunting a fox, someone is dragging a, a smelly rag, which basically leaves the scent of a fox behind, and, and people chase that, around the, uh, chase that around the countryside. Actually, I think hunting is more or less split into three groups currently. There are people who are completely obeying the law, happy to follow, a, a, do a drag hunt, as it's called, follow this smelly rag, um, there are other people who maybe follow the smelly rag, but when they, if no one's watching and if a fox crosses their path, maybe accidentally the, uh, the fox is chased. And I do think in some of the more remote and unsupervised rural areas, uh, fox hunting continues probably pretty much as it always did. Uh, so there we are. The one I saw come up just now, I've got, I've got time for one more before the end, I think. What are some of the biggest issues facing rural areas are facing today? Well, I've only got a few minutes to, uh, to zip through some of these, so I would say uh, some of the biggest, area, uh, biggest things are housing. Definitely always right up there. The affordable housing is a real problem, you know. And also housing in the other sense, for people who don't like new housing in their area, that uh, they, they think too much of the countryside is being concreted over. So I think housing is right up there as a, as a critical issue for people in rural areas. I think uh, things like the provision of good phone services and good digital services are of great concern to people. I think increasingly as well we've seen a shrinkage of some of the other services, access to to health and education and things like that, and transport. We've seen you know, rural buses under real pressure, and I think there is a way of being a bit cleverer about combining the sort of old hitchhiking uh, methods with current uh, internet-enabled uh, methods and Uber and things like that to get a sort of version of that to help solve rural transport. Oh, I think I saw one more that I might just be able to click into, or is that that one? I think we'll... Uh, yeah, I think we'll probably leave it there on uh, what were some of the biggest rural issues. So um, I hope that's been uh, of interest or of uh, some kind of use to you. Um, I am uh, delivering this, this great lives lecture this evening at, uh, here at the University of Lincoln. It will be live streamed and will be available on the university's Facebook page. So maybe some of you can catch that. In the meantime, thanks very much for watching. See ya.